Okay, maybe let me let me start. So, um, what I said, so what I'll talk about today is to um, describe this um, space of stability conditions, right? So, um, let me define this. This is the um, right. So, recall last time I fixed this um, um, finite rank lattice. Um, that's a quotient of the K group. And now I define stab lambda of X to be the, the topological space. I, I also sketched the topology. The topological space of stability conditions where the central charge factors via lambda and that satisfied is a property of, of pre-stability conditions satisfying support properties. And I'll, I'll call this a, a stability condition. A stability condition is a pre-stability condition that satisfies support property. Okay, and I mean, the, what, the goal that I'll prove today that it, this isn't just a complex space, it's actually a finer dimensional complex manifold. Right, so goal. Um, this is a complex manifold. And I, I'll make this statement more precisely. Okay, but, but before I go into these, and I mean, so I'll, I'll first do more of the abstract machinery and then do some, hopefully some examples today to, um, towards the end. And then, then more tomorrow. So tomorrow I'll describe this for uh, algebraic surfaces. Okay, but before I do this, I want to um, make something explicit that I already touched upon Im implicitly. Right, so you can, I mean, we want to study deformations of the stability condition as we deform Z. And of course, there are sort of two kinds of deformations. One that leave the kernel of Z unchanged, and the others that, that do change the kernel. Right? So in other words, GL2, let's say plus R, acts on harm from lambda to Z. Right, via the identification C isomorphic to R squared. And I want to lift this to an action on the space here. And so for this, you should note that it acts on, um, right, since it acts on C, it also acts on S1. I just take a vector S1, apply your element of GL to R, and then we scale it to be in S1. And this means that the universal cover um, GL2 plus R acts on, on the universal cover of S1. And somehow, in, to keep in line with my convention so far, this I'll explicitly think of this cover as given by phi maps to e to the i pi phi. Right, somehow this matches the relation between central charges and um, phases. Okay, and so. Um, The proposition is that this universal cover acts on star lambda of x via so g dot um, if I'm given the pair z comma p, then this gets sent to a g composed with z and p prime where um, p prime of g dot phi is equal to p of phi. Right, so we're here, this is this action on R that I described up here. 
right? And so to, to make this as explicit, right, so you have the, of course you have Z star inside GL2 plus R, and the universal cover of that is C, right? And if you take C in here, and then um, psi to be an argument of a, a choice of one over pi times the choice of argument of C, right, which corresponds to lifting this element to the universal cover, then in this case you just get um, um, right, in, in this case um, C comma psi dot C comma P is um, C times C and P prime, where now P prime of phi plus psi is just equal to P of phi. Right. And now we had this, we had this other description of um, right, stability conditions given as a, as a pair of a central charge and, and A, and an abelian category A. Right. And so how, how can we see this? in this other description, in the, in the other definition, right? So here you have here you have this upper half plane corresponding to A. And then, I mean, some of what this definition is saying is that, right, um, say I'm Say my complex number is some um, uh, is, is, is something like of the form one plus i in that direction, right? And this is rotating objects in this upper half plane to um, to somehow a tilted upper half plane. Right. So this is this is c times h. And um, right, this, this still corresponds to A with respect to the new stability condition. But what corresponds to the upper half plane with respect to this new stability condition? Well, for this, we have to cut off our original heart into two pieces. Right, if you look at um, the negative real axis in this tilted half plane, this corresponds to um, this ray, uh, I guess blue is difficult to this too. So maybe let me draw a separate picture over here, right? So I have this ray over here, and I can use this to construct my torsion pair. Here's my F, and here's my T. Right, and it turns out then after you rotate, the T is below the real axis, but if I shift it back by minus one, then I get, um, right, so in the new picture, it looks like this. I have here F, and here I have T shifted by minus one. Right, so in other words, the new heart, A prime, this is the tilt that the torsion pair shifted by minus one. Right, where A sharp is the tilt of A at the torsion pair. Torsion pair um, T comma F. Right, so if you remember A sharp contains um, T and it contains F shifted by one. So if you shift everything by minus one, you get F and T shifted by minus one. And so this, um, you already see that somehow this action, which in one description does something completely trivial, does something slightly less trivial in the other description. I wrote, sorry? So, so, so the, 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 the blue line is somehow the uh, pre-image of the negative real axis under the inverse multiplication. <coughs> Uh, 
Okay, any, any more questions? Okay. Okay, so now let, let me just state a precise theorem. And, right, and so this is, so let me here use in big letters Bridgeland, somehow that's the main result of the theory. But the way I'll state it, it's actually, um, so we made this a little bit more precise in joint work by myself and Emmanuel Macri and Stellari. And, um, the proof I'll explain today is um, due to myself, so I posted this as a preprint uh, a few months ago if you're interested in reading it up afterwards. Okay, but let, let, me, let me state the results. So this, the statement is that star lambda of t is a complex manifold, a finite dimensional complex manifold, and the dimension is equal to the rank of lambda, as you'll see in a second, it's namely, um, right, there's a natural forgetful map from the space of stability condition to this vector space arm from lambda to C. That's then C comma P to Z. Right, so, so this is a local homeomorphism. Right. So, for example, it could be a covering of an open subset, but it could also be more, more complicated, right? So, it, it just says locally, locally on the source, it's an isomorphism. And, um, right, and now let me state a slightly more effective version that, that appeared in this joint paper with... Um, Manuel Macri and uh, Paolo Stellari. Um, right, so given, given such a stability condition, let's say that it satisfies the support property with respect to a given quadratic form from lambda r to r. Okay, so, so if you came late, this email this person if you um, lost or found anything. Okay, so... Um, so let um, P of Q inside... Um, Arm of lambda to C, the open subset, be the set of C prime such that Q restricted to the kernel of C prime is negative definite. Right, and then typically this will have two components, and I write PZ of Q for the component containing containing Z. Then what, what I'll claim is that as long as I deform Z within this open subset, then I can freely deform the um, corresponding stability conditions, so freely and uniquely. Right, so then there is um, an open neighborhood such that the restriction of this curly Z from U sigma to PZ of Q is a covering. Okay, and moreover, all sigma prime in U sigma satisfy the support property with respect to the same Q.
right? And, and I mean, somehow this, this last statement maybe will become more interesting tomorrow because you'll see that this, right, what is Q? It's a quadratic inequality for Chern classes of semi-stable objects. And it turns out that in geometric situation, this is really something deep and meaningful, bogomolov gieseke inequality for surfaces, and something we don't quite understand yet for, for, for threefolds. Right? And so, I mean, maybe let me, let me rephrase this, right? So in other words, right, so for any deformation, Right, ZT of Z equals Z naught. Right here, this is for T in the unit interval. Whenever I'm giving a deformation, a path in the space of central charges, such that the kernel Q is always negative definite in the kernel, then I can uniquely lift this to a path of stability conditions. As a unique Lift sigma t equal z t comma p t. Right. So this. Um, right. And maybe let me make one more comment on this. Right. So if you if you think about the second definition of stability, it's kind of very unsatisfying because I had to give you the list of I had to explicitly give you the list of semi-stable objects. Right, the, the P of phi, the list of semi-stable objects, was part of the datum, whereas usually when you try to define stability, you, somehow you, de you define a condition of stability and then work out what the stable objects are. Well, it turns out that once we fix this at the beginning, at least um, this problem is solved once and forever. Right? It says, once I've started with some notion of stability, then when I deform it, I'm told uniquely how to adopt a set of stable objects along the way. So once I've chosen the starting point, a set of stable objects along this path is uniquely determined. The kernel, kernel ZT. Yeah. Yeah, so that's my shorthand notation for negative definite. Okay, so basically most of what I'll do today is just the um, sketch of the proof of the statement. I mean, the proof is not really simplified enough that it makes sense to present it in a, in a lecture like this. And so let me first make a simplifying assumption. I will assume that um, Q has signature Um, two comma rank lambda minus two. Right? In, in particular, there's an associated non-degenerate symmetric form. In particular, associated symmetric form form is non-degenerate. Right? And, and that's, that's only a small assumption. I mean, the, the kernel of Z has at least rank equal to dimension equal to rank of lambda minus 2. So we know the negative dimension, the negative part of the signature must be at least this. Right? And this can be, I mean, in non-trivial cases, this will always be 1 or 2. So it's only a mild assumption that this is 2. OK. And, um, Let me write k equal to for the kernel of z, and then k orthogonal for the orthogonal complement with respect to the symmetric bilinear form. And note that under this assumption, um, z from the orthogonal complement to C is an isomorphism. 
Right, so... Um, um, right, just because by construction, K is, Z is injective and restricted to the orthogonal complement, and K perp has rank, has rank two. Um, and now we can, we can always use the GL2 um, plus R action to make this an isometry. Isometry, right, with respect to, I mean, of course, here I have the standard norm, and here I have a positive quadratic form, which also gives me a norm. Right, with respect to um, norm on k perp associated to q and the standard norm on, on c. Okay, and then let me, um, if you let this be the norm on on the kernel associated to minus q, minus q, and p from lambda r to k, the orthogonal projection, then you get that the quadratic form is just of the form z of v, squared minus norm of p of v squared. And so this basically just a slick way to, to, to choose to use coordinates. Right, and so, so in particular, I mean, maybe this is worth rephrasing. So q of e, um, q of v of e greater or equal to zero, this now becomes equivalent to saying that um, the norm of z of e is greater or equal than the norm of p of e. Right. So, so another way to think of the support property, it, it, it is saying that, I mean, if you look at the norm of z of e for semi-stable objects, and then it cannot be too small compared to the norm of e in, inside the um, inside, inside lambda r. And that, that's some of the, the version of the power property that, you'll, that you would find in, in, in Tom Richards' papers. Okay, and now, um, so here's another, another easy lemma. Really up to the um, GL2 plus R action, every Z prime in PZ of Q is of the form um, Z prime equals Z plus a function just defined on. Um, on the kernel, where the norm of u is less than one. Right, so some are saying this, this condition that z prime, q is also negative on the kernel of z prime, just not corresponds very explicitly to the fact that z prime does not differ too much from z. Right, and the, um, we just write part of the proof, right? I mean, z prime restricted to the orthogonal complement. This is always an isomorphism because q is positive definite here and q is negative definite on the kernel of z prime, right? And so you can always use you can use the GL2 plus R action to achieve the um, prime restricted to 
k orthogonal is equal to z restricted k orthogonal. And then they, they claim easily for us. Okay, and now somehow the, the first key idea is that, that we can now break this up, right? So this is some variation of Z. We can break this up into one, first one deformation where U is completely real and then a second one where U is completely imaginary, right? So write U equal real part of U plus I times imaginary part of U, right? And then first you deform Z to um, Z plus the real part of U. And, and, and why is this useful? Well, the reason is that these kind of deformations look, um, look very nice with respect to the first definition of stability condition that I gave. Right, when, in other words, I mean, what is it saying? It is saying that the imaginary part of the central charge is constant. And so if you think about this upper half plane picture, then the objects, right, the, all the objects are somehow wandering on horizontal lines. Right, and so as long as we can control what happens with objects here on the negative real line, we don't actually have to change the, um, the heart of the T-structure at all. Right, so here we can keep A equal P of 0, 1 constant. Right, and then the, the, the second step is you deform Z plus real part of U to Z plus real part of U plus I times the imaginary part of U. And I mean, either you say this is analogous when you replace all these arguments using the upper half plane by somehow using the right half plane, or it's just equivalent to the previous one by the GL2 to, to Rx. It's equivalent um, to first step by a GL2 plus R. Excellent. Okay, so, so from now on, I'll assume that I'm just in the first step, so I'll assume that um, U from the kernel is it's just a real function. It still satisfies this property that the norm is at most one. So, so I, yeah, so it does not, I mean, I'll, I'll, what I'll show is that this assumption actually will imply that I never hit zero here. Yeah. Right, so, so in fact, that's exactly my first claim. So the claim is that, right, so let me write C1 for C plus U under this assumption. Um, I claim that this is a stability function function for A equal P of 0, 1. Right, and so for the proof, there are two cases. If I take E in A, then if the imaginary part of Z of A is positive, then the imaginary part of Z1 of A is positive. So that's okay. And what if, what if the imaginary part of Z of A is equal to zero? Right, then, then this means that um, E is Z is semi-stable. Sorry?
Yeah, if E is in an object in the heart, that's a matching part of the of, uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Right, so, so now the point is that this means that, um, right, this means that Q of E is greater or equal to zero, or in other words, that P of E is less than or equal to um, the absolute value of Z of E, which is equal to minus the real part of Z of E. And so this means if you take Z1 of E, This is less than or equal to, um, right, which is the same as um, minus c of e here, assumed to be real. Right, and c1 of e is less than or equal to z of e plus um, u times p of e, just by the definition of the operator norm. But this is strictly less than 1. And this is at most this, so this is less than zero, right? So, so in other words, I mean, really, where does it come from? The, it comes from the fact that the support property guarantees that if I deform my z a little bit like this, then the, the, the central charge of stable objects only varies by a controlled amount, right? This is exactly what this argument is showing. And of course, somehow, this is the key idea that we'll, that we'll use, use more. Sorry? Um, here, well, no, I'm assuming now that U is real. Yeah. My time throughout, uh, I'll assume throughout now that U is real. Right? And now, so, so what's the next thing we have to prove? We have to prove that Z1 satisfies the, I mean, we want to construct a stability condition from the heart A and from Z1. So the next thing is we, is that we have to show that Z1 has the heart on Z1 property, right? And so the key, the second key idea is that, um, right, for each E and A, we know that um, that it has a hadron zimmern polygon with respect to Z, right? This high H and Z of E, the hadron zimmern polygon of E with respect to the starting Z is finite polyhedral on the left. Because, I mean, maybe I didn't make this explicit on Monday. Right, so what I showed on Monday that if the hadron zimmern polygon is finite polyhedral on the left, then the, we have hadron zimmern filtrations. But it's also easy to show that the converse holds. Right, and, um, and now we'll, we'll show that it also has, that also HNZ1 of E is finite polyhedral on the left. Okay. Right, and so, so we'll start with this part of the Zimmern polygon of E. And somehow we have to show that um, Right. Somehow we have to show that there aren't infinitely many objects of subclass that can come here to the left and make some of, make this harder than Zimmern polygon um, suddenly not discrete on the left um, with respect to Z1. Right. Somehow we have to show that if you um, if you have any object, if you have any um, Z1 of A that's somehow here on the left to I mean, right, so E will deform a little bit, let's say, to TZ1 of E. Then if you look at, 
uh, central charges of subobjects of E um, that have some central central charge with respect to Z1 on the left, then we want that there are only finitely many such objects, or more precisely, only finitely many many V of A possible. Right? And some of, um, of course, part of the idea will be that, I mean, if Z1 of A here is on the left, then we'll show that Z of A is, um, can't be too far away. And, I mean, if A was, were somehow false to be Z stable, then this wouldn't be too difficult, because as we've already seen, the central charge of stable objects doesn't differ too much between Z and Z1. But we also, I mean, A doesn't necessarily have to be Z stable, so we have to make the argument a little bit more general. Okay, and some of the key ingredient that makes this possible is the Right, A is just a sub-object so that Z1 of A is somewhat to the left of Z1 of, of E. Right, so that it could possibly contribute to a, you know, infinite set of extremal points of this Harder Zimmern polygon of, um, right, so this, I mean, this is the goal, that this is finite polyhedra on the left, and somehow we have to show that it's somehow spanned by finitely many points on the left. Okay, so if E is in A, then the mass Mz of E is defined to be the um, length in quotation marks of the hardener zimmern polygon. And so here by length, I just mean the length of the path on the left, right? So here, um, just this part over here. And I could also write it as the sum over the absolute values of the central charges of the hadron zimmern filtration factors, right, if EI is the HN filtration. Okay, and so, the, 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 I mean, basically this is the quantity that will control everything. And um, I mean, the first lemma is that if E is in A, then the norm of the projection of E to the kernel of Z is at most is bounded by the mass of E. Right, and so. And the proof just follows from the fact that, I mean, if you take the norm of the projection of a hadron zimmern filtration quotient, then this is bounded above by, by, the, by its central charge, right? That's exactly this condition that um, for semi-stable objects that the, that the support property gives. Okay, so by, this is by the support property. Right, and then if you sum this up, on the right-hand side you get the mass, and on the left-hand side you get something bigger than P of E by the triangle inequality. Right? And, 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 and this is already good because, I mean, somehow we've seen that if I compare Z, and Z of E and Z1 of E, then somehow the difference is controlled by the, um, by the norm of P of E, and now it's controlled by the mass of E, which is something we can control geometrically. Let me... The following lemma is completely trivial, but let me nevertheless state it. 
make this explicit. Right? If A is a subobject of E, then of course the Hadron Zimmern polygon is a subset of the Hadron Zimmern polygon of E. It is, there's nothing to prove here. Just because every subobject of A is a subobject of E. And this now implies the following. If you have if A is a subobject of E, then I have right, I mean I would what I would really like to do, I would like to bound the mass of A in terms of the mass of E. But that's clearly not possible, right? Because I might have a subobject somewhere over here to the right. And then clearly the mass of that subobject could be bigger than the mass of E. And somehow what this glamour is saying that this is really the only thing that can happen. So more precisely, if you control by the real part of the central chart, then for every subobject, the mass is less than the mass of E. Okay, and so the, the proof is really by by picture. Let me write it. Let's say this is the this is the Hadron Zimmern polygon of of E, and then our Hadron Zimmern polygon of A will somehow be contained in here. And now I, I compare the following two paths. Right, I take a I take a number x somewhere sufficiently big, and I look at this path that follows the Haron Zimmern polygon of E up to this point, um, up to this point with real value equal to x, and then I do the same thing with A. Then, so gamma is the path that follows the Haron Zimmern polygon up to Z of A, and then just continues horizontally until the, the real part reaches this value X. Right? So it, it's, um, I'm, I'm constructing two paths here. They first follow the boundary of the Haron Zimmern polygon, and then follow the, um, just go. It, it stops, right, I've chosen just a real number x that's sufficiently big, and I just choose like right, and then yes. I mean from the picture, it's sort of clear that the length of gamma a is less than the length of gamma e. But I mean the length of this one is equal to the mass of a plus x minus the real part of z of a. And the same thing over here. Plus x minus the real. Right, and that's that's how you get um, how you get this bound here. Okay, I mean that that. And, and I mean, that kind of argument hopefully explains why I like drawing these pictures so much. But of course, I mean, the definition of mass already appears in the physics literature. But I mean, to make statements like that, uh, I mean, just in terms of this formula, but I mean, to make statements like that, it's really helpful to have these pictures. Okay, and now, um, the final lemma is that I claim that given C, in R, there exists the prime in R such that if if A is a subobject of E that is somewhat to the left with respect to Z1 of this real number, then the real part of Z of A is bounded by C prime. 
right? And, and I mean, really, I mean, intuitively, I hope you already have an idea that this, that this may follow from these, from these objects because somewhere we've sort of bounded the mass of sub-objects. We know that the um, projection to the kernel is then bounded in terms of the mass, and we know that the variation of central charges is bounded in terms of this projection. Right, and so yeah, so let's make this explicit. So if C is bigger than the real part of C1 of A, then this is of course greater or equal to the real part of MZ of A um, minus U times the norm of P of A. So here I'm just using the uh, definition of operator norm. Okay, but I mean this, of course, I can re I can replace just by the mass um, by by this lemma up here. And then if I rewrite this, I get the following. I can write this as one minus u times the um, real part of z of a. Um, minus u times um, the mass of a minus the real part of c of a. Right, so far, I've just I haven't done anything. But the point now is that right this I can this I can bound. First, I can bound u by the operator norm by one, and I know I can bound this one by the corresponding expression for e. Right, and so now you see that this one is, this one is independent of a, this term is independent of a, a, and so if you solve this inequality, you get an inequality for the real part of z of a. So, I mean, I'm replacing this one by this one. Yeah, so this, yeah. Yeah, using, using um, this lemma here. Okay, and so, Now the conclusion goes as follows. I take, um, if you're given an A of a subobject of E with um, real part Z1 of A um, less than or equal to the maximum of zero and real part of Z1 of E, Right, and from the previous lemma, we see that the real part of Z of A is bounded above. But of course, we also know that Z of A is contained in the hadron simon polygon. Right, so this, this really means that Z of A is, lies in a compact region. So, or in other words, the absolute value of Z of A is bounded above. But then this also means that the, right, using this lemma here, this also means that the mass is bounded above. And then using the lemma before that, this means that the operator norm, that, that the norm of the projection to the kernel is bounded above. Right, and so this means both the projection to the kernel and the pro and z of a um, lie in a compact region. So this means there are really there are only finitely many possible only finitely many possibilities for for 
V of A. Right? On the one hand, it's contained in the lattice. On the other hand, by these two conditions, it's contained in a, it's contained in a, a compact subset of lambda R. And so, right, and so by what I said on Monday, this means that the hadron zimmern polygon is finite polyhedral on the left. And so C1 has the hadron zimmern property. Right. And, and by the way, note that, I mean, at all times, these inequalities or these estimates that are used were quite sharp, right? As soon as the norm of u becomes strictly equal to 1, everything goes down. Everything collapses, right? And I no longer get a bound over here. Okay. Um, But then, I mean, then the, the, the second step is really just the same argument with, I mean, are, are, are really the same up to the GL2 plus Rx. Right, so, but, I mean, what, what remains to prove? So, is that, um, um, Z1 comma A still satisfied as a pro property with respect to Q. Okay, and so, I mean, I'll be a bit more sketchy here. So, I mean, similar arguments. So that there are really only finitely many classes. I mean, if I said ZT to be Z plus T times um, a U composed with P for T in 0, 1, then I claim that there are only finitely many classes um, of subobjects many classes um, v of a of subobjects a into e that destabilize e for any possible for 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 some t that destabilize E for some T. Right, you can easily imagine that this follows with similar arguments. And particularly, I mean, you have something like wall crossing, right? There are only finitely many possible classes that I have to take into account when I look at where could the given objects become unstable? You know, um, um, assume, right, so now assume that E is, element A is C1 stable, and it violates the, the support property. Right, then, then it follows that it is C0 unstable. And so it follows that it is strictly semi-stable at some point in between. The T1 um, semi-stable. At some point in between. And, and it also follows that um, E has a Jordan, what's called a jordan Herder filtration. So what is this? It's a filtration 
where all the filtration portions are same as are stable and of the same phase, which um, factors Dt1 stable of the same phase. Right, and now the, the observation is simply that um, Right, so somewhere here you have dt1 of e, and there is a filtration e1, e2, uh, e3, and so on, whose center charges all lie on the same ray so that the quotients are ct1 stable. Right, and so it follows that z of e. On the one hand, that's equal to the sum of the absolute values of the central charges of the filtration quotients. Right, and now this is, um, by assumptions, this is less than the norm of P of E. Right, that's, that's equivalent I mean, that's equivalent to Q of E less than zero. And of course, by the triangle inequality, this is less than or equal to the sum of the norms of the P of the projection of these filtration quotients. Right, and, and so if you look at this chain of inequalities, it follows that one EI modulo EI minus one also violates the support property. Right. Okay, but now I can play the same game. I can play the same game. This will be, again, this will be unstable with respect to Z0, so there's a T2 in between. That becomes strictly semi-stable. And then, I mean, that part I'll really sketch. Right. I, I won't say much about, I mean, um, it's Z T2 semi-stable. Right, and so on. And I mean, really quite similar finiteness arguments as I already sketched show that um, this can't go on infinitely, right? This, this process terminates. Terminates, and so I do have an, which is a contradiction because we know that um, no, stable, no zero stable object violates this property. Right, and so this, this shows that Z1, comma A satisfies the support property with respect to the same Q. And in particular, now I can apply the same argument for the imaginary part. Right? This, of course, only works if for the second deformation I start with the same estimates for the, for the same stable objects. Okay, so... Um, you know, I wanted to do some examples, but maybe let me write a step two minutes early since I wouldn't fit this into two minutes. Thank you. <laughs>